Hi, I'm Larry Huppen. I'm a medical consultant at ProLab Orthotics and over the next few minutes we are going to look at some best practices for orthotic therapy when treating metatarsalgia. So very quickly we're just going to do a quick definition of metatarsalgia. It's obviously a broad term, just means pain under the metatarsal heads and it can be due to a number of different pathologies. It could be due to capsulitis, uh, plantar plate tear, Morton's neuroma, could be the issue is a neuropathic ulceration, although that may not be pain. Uh, we're still trying to get pressure off the area, and our treatment is going to be very similar. You may have forefoot pain related to, uh, to an arthritis, such as rheumatoid arthritis. It could be painful keratoma. So obviously, there's a lot of different things that can cause pain under the metatarsal heads. However, when we treat this problem, we're probably going to be trying to accomplish the same thing with essentially all of these. And that's two things. Number one is we want to reduce forefoot pressure. And second, in many cases, particularly in the presence of callus, blister, or ulceration, we also want to reduce forefoot friction. So as we go through this, we're going to look at how to do both of those things. Let's start by looking at forefoot pressure. We have five orthotic recommendations or modifications that you can prescribe in order to accomplish this. The first one is that you want to use a non-deforming material or a minimally deforming material. What we mean here is that the orthosis shell will not deform excessively under body weight. If it does deform excessively, it has less ability to transfer pressure off of the metatarsal heads. So these are materials such as polypropylene or graphite that just don't give very much. And this was shown in a study by Chalmers in 2000. He showed that a semi-rigid orthosis had a significant effect on pain, where soft orthoses or shoes only did not. Now, one of the things we're trying to do here is to transfer the pressure from here back out to this area onto the mid arch of the foot. And the other nice thing we can do with these firmer materials is if we wish, we can leave this leading edge thicker. So normally that leading edge is going to be beveled down very thin. But what you can do is leave this, ask your lab to do a non beveled distal edge and then this will help transfer some pressure off the metatarsal head onto the metatarsal neck. And if for any reason the patient doesn't tolerate that very well, it's very easy to later go ahead and bevel that down. The second recommendation is that you have the orthosis conform very close to the arch of the foot. This was well demonstrated by Mueller in 2006. Uh, in this study, they showed that a total contact insert, meaning one that grabs the arch very close, reduces excessive pressure at the metatarsal heads. And it does so by increasing the contact area force. And if we look at these two orthoses here, you can see how this one gaps away from the arch of the foot when the foot is put back into that casting position whereas this one conforms very close to the arch of the foot. So this one that conforms very close is going to be have a greater area of force back here to transfer that pressure off the metatarsal heads. So that was our second recommendation is close conforming of uh, having the orthosis conform close to the arch of the foot. Now you accomplish that by doing a couple things. Number one, proper casting technique is absolutely critical. And what we're talking about there is holding the foot in subtalar joint neutral, the mid-tarsal joint locked, and also plantar flexing the first ray to the end of its range of motion. Let's look at back at that previous picture. By plantar flexing that first ray to the end of the range of motion, you enhance the arch, so you have an orthosis then that conforms closer to the arch and better transfers pressure off of the ball of the foot. Second, you want to prescribe a minimum cast fill. And let's look at these plaster casts. Now, now, nowadays, most casts are actually virtual, meaning they're on the computer. We don't really see plaster very often anymore. But this does demonstrate it well. The blue here is the initial plaster that was poured into the negative cast, where the white is what the lab has added for expansion and fill. So here's the medial arch fill. On this one that's closest to us, we have quite a bit of white, so we have a lot of fill added. Now that orthosis is going to gap away from the arch of the foot. We're back here, we see much more blue and just a little bit of white. This would be considered a minimum fill. We just added a little bit of plaster into the arch of the foot. So one of the things you have to uh, make sure you do as a practitioner is ensure that your lab is not overfilling the medial arch. And the best way to determine that is to when have that patient come back in when you're dispensing the orthosis 
put the patient back in, an, in a casting position and ensure that that device is conforming close to the arch of the foot. If you prescribe a minimum cast fill, it should conform quite close. The other thing that you can do when you're writing this uh, prescription is to invert the positive cast. We're looking at this milled positive cast here. We can see that it is thicker under the first, thinner under the fifth. That means this has been left inverted or uh, prescribed inverted. And what that allows the arch to do is to drop farther down. So now we once again have a higher arch. So with the lab that I use, at ProLab, we, if I do a minimum fill with about two degrees of inversion, I know I'm going to get an extremely tight fit to the arch of the foot. And so that's what would be my recommendation for uh, a patient with metatarsalgia where you're trying to transfer pressure. The next is that you want to use metatarsal pads or metatarsal bars to further transfer pressure off the metatarsal heads and get that pressure back onto the metatarsal neck and shaft region. Here's a metatarsal pad and here's a, I'm sorry, here's a metatarsal bar and here is a metatarsal pad. Hastings in 2003 showed um, that metatarsal pads that were placed between 6.1 millimeters and 10.6 millimeters proximal to the metatarsal heads resulted in significant pink plantar pressure reduction compared to wearing that total contact insert alone. So he's talking about that leading edge, just call it about a centimeter proximal to the metatarsal head being the most effective location for that metatarsal pad. Landorf uh, did a similar study in 2014, and what he did is he had five options here. The first was a control with no padding. Then he had a metatarsal pad with the leading edge placed 10 millimeters proximal to the metatarsal head. He had a metatarsal pad with the leading edge 5 millimeters distal to the metatarsal head. He had a metatarsal bar, and then he had what he called a plantar cover, which is essentially a metatarsal bar along with poron underneath the metatarsal heads for cushioning. And here's what he found. He found that the metatarsal pad that was placed proximal to the metatarsal head decreased pressure by about 9%, and the metatarsal pad alone by about 10%. So not bad, but look at the next two. So the metatarsal pad that was placed proximal, to, I'm sorry, distal to the metatarsal head, reduced pressure by 17%. And the plantar cover, which is the metatarsal pad plus cushioning, decreased the pressure by 19%. So uh, we're, you're going to want to go with either the metatarsal pad or the plantar cover in most cases for the most effective decrease in pressure under those metatarsal heads. Our next recommendation is to glue the top cover posterior only, and that's what this shows here. Top cover is glued on the, on the proximal half of the orthosis, but not on the distal half. And that just allows easy modification of the metatarsal pad or metatarsal bar, uh, although these studies show us essentially where they should be placed for optimum pressure reduction. That doesn't mean that's where the patient's necessarily going to find it most comfortable. So that can be a bit subjective, and you want the ability to have to, to be able to change these modifications without having to rip off the cover and put on a new cover. Once you're sure that it's comfortable for the patient, the metatarsal pad is the right height and the right location, then you can go ahead and glue those down. That's one reason I actually recommend adding these in your office, if at all possible. I think you're more likely to have a, uh, a device that's both comfortable and effective. The next is to use forefoot cushioning. Again, I think that was shown in the Landorf study quite well. But what essentially cushioning does is it decreases velocity, and by doing so, it decreases force. So here's a pour on extension to the sulcus on this cover. Uh, you could go to the sulcus or go to the toes. It probably doesn't matter very much. So this might be a really good prescription for a patient with metatarsalgia. Uh, obviously, without the foot here, we don't know how close this conforms to the arch, but we'll make an assumption that it's conforming very close because we used a minimum fill and a couple degrees of inversion. We have a metatarsal pad here, our metatarsal bar here. We have pour on extension, and the cover is glued posterior only. And in addition, we have a fairly rigid material. All right, so the next thing we want to look at is how to reduce friction.
Now this is true in the case that you may have a callus, an ulcer, or a blister. All of these have a friction component along with a pressure component that contributes to them. And there are more and more studies now showing, particularly on diabetic, on diabetic ulcerations, that friction may play a larger role than pressure in forming these ulcerations. So the way we're going to treat this is to put a material on the orthosis in the area that is at risk that has a very low coefficient of friction. And the only material that's actually available is a material called PTFE, or, petro, or uh, polytetrafluoroethylene. It's a patch, essentially like a medical grade Teflon. And it just has a very, very low coefficient of friction in order to reduce the shear forces that contribute to these pathologies. So this is an interesting material. It has the lowest coefficient of friction available to anything you put on orthosis. It's actually developed initially as a suture uh, for very fragile uh, structures such as vessels and nerves because it has such a low coefficient of friction. But now it's approved by the FDA as a medical device to be applied to orthotic devices. So it reduces friction and reduces shear to help healing on the plantar foot. And you want to probably combine that with an offloading orthotic for, for pressure and then using the PTFE for friction. That way you're getting both the horizontal or shear forces plus the vertical or pressure forces uh, that contribute to these problems. And you can apply these to the orthosis anywhere that uh, there might be a callus, an ulcer, or a blister. These are self-adhesive. You can apply to any area of the orthotic or shoe. And now you do not want to apply it to the foot. These go on the orthosis or the shoe. They're very interesting in that they're water or sweat resistant. All orthotic materials, all orthotic covers that you would apply to an orthosis will have an increased coefficient when they get wet, except for PTFE. It's latex free and they're pre-cut pads. You just uh, peel and stick. You want them to extend maybe about four or five millimeters beyond the uh, beyond the lesion, beyond the callus or the ulceration. Now you would never want to cover an entire orthosis with PTFE because the patient would slide right off of it. I would suggest you have these available in your office uh, and just um, charge the patient for them as there's no L code. And critical to educate your patient at, as to what they are and what they do. And they do need to re be replaced, I find, about every six months. And they'll start to get little crinkles or wrinkles in them, the kind of white lines that go across it. I teach the patient and then the, the, that they can just heat this up with a hairdryer, peel it off, and put another one on. So our summary here is that your optimum outcomes for patients with metatarsalgia, regardless of the cause of that metatarsalgia, are going to be achieved by decreasing forefoot pressure and decreasing forefoot friction, decreased pressure by using non-deforming materials, having an orthosis that conforms close to the arch, use metatarsal pads or bars to transfer pressure off the ball of the foot, glue your covers posterior only, and use forefoot cushion. Decrease friction by using PTFE patches that have a low coefficient of friction. A few resources. If you go uh, to our website, uh, prolaborthotics.com, you can search within the site by pathology to find recommended orthotic prescriptions. We have art, uh, summaries of journal articles, uh, separate articles, videos, a number of webinars like this one. Also, if you're a ProLab client, medical consultants are available to discuss specific patients. And this is an interesting book uh, by Paul Shear, uh, Recent Advances in Orthotic Therapy. It does look at specific orthotic recommendations and prescriptions uh, by pathology pathology based on current literature. So thanks for listening and watching. Uh, if you have any questions, you can go to the website. You can call at that number listed or email at CS for customer service at prolab-usa.com.